Welcome to another episode of Conversations. Today we have Dr. Alexandra Stockwell. Welcome. I'm so happy to have you here today. I'm really glad to be here too. Yes. So um, you are an intimate marriage expert. That is correct. <laughs> How'd you get there? How did, what made you decide you wanted to get into uh, deep into the marriage? Topic? Actually, it was for my own sake. Um, I was practicing medicine. I have four children. Now I've been married 28 years. I can't remember exactly how many years I would have been married by back then. But anyway, my <laughs> husband and I met the first, the first week of medical school. And the first 10 years of our marriage, basically, we were in medical training, working 60, 70, 80, 90, sometimes 100 hours a week and had babies in diapers. And the point is, we really didn't have a lot of time with one another. So we were very compatible and really aligned in our big decisions and daily life, not much conflict. But in terms of intimacy and passion and pleasure and a kind of deliciousness, I always just assumed that once we had more time together, that would really blossom because we were otherwise so drawn to one another. And so now like fast forward about 10 years, we're not working evenings. I'm not working any weekends. He does occasionally and our children aren't in diapers anymore. And so we have all this time to really, I mean, it's not like tons of time cause we're still working and have four kids, right. but you know, we have more time together and nothing changed. And I realized, oh, it's actually not only time that we need. So lots of different things happen, but eventually I decided to do a really in-depth training in sensuality and sexuality for myself and my marriage. But it was a training that doubled as a coach training. And at the time I'd never heard of like, I just didn't know what a coach was and that wasn't of interest to me, but I was really interested in how someone would learn to help people in this arena. Mm -hmm. And so I just went to the teaching lab, really just curious how they were going to teach people to teach people. And I just felt like I'd come home and pretty much all of my life just started to, I started to rearrange it. And so this is what I do full time. It's been coming up on 11 years. Oh, wow. That's wonderful. I'm sure you're busy because, you know, I uh, am former hairstylist. I worked with mostly women and had a lot of women in my chair and this topic can come up. I listened to one of your, she also has a podcast people and um, it is the intimate marriage podcast. And because you are a guest, I wanted to listen, kind of see what your podcast sounded like. And I listened to the episode about when couples live more like roommates. And I recently just did a podcast about empty nesters. And I thought this is a really good segue into something like this, because that's kind of what happens once you're, you're busy, 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 busy. And then the kids are gone and you just kind of look at your spouse and it's like, what do we even like? What do we even like to do together? Who are you? And so how do you start building that intimacy back up after kind of feeling estranged in the same house? Yeah. And estranged is not really an exaggeration. So I like very much how you've painted the landscape and asked the question. So before I answer, I want to share where I'm coming from. My basic principles that inform all of the work that I do is the uncompromising intimacy methodology. And in fact, the name of my book is uncompromising intimacy. And so let me say what I mean by that. So throughout the Western world, the most, one second, throughout the Western world, the most commonly given relationship advice is that you need to compromise. If you want to have a happy marriage, you have to be good at compromise. Compromise is the way to stay connected and keep a marriage going. That's just completely wrong. If what you want is a pleasant, bland companionship, if you want, you know, roommates with a little bit of affection, then compromise is definitely a good way to go. But if you want 
not to be roommates, but to really be husband and wife, lovers, be intimate in all kinds of ways, body, soul, and spirit, and have pleasure and passion that continues to grow. And having an empty nest means all this opportunity because there's nobody else in the house and you can go have adventures and you can stay home and have adventures. Like that kind of a relationship really comes with uncompromising intimacy. Now, when I use the word uncompromising, I don't mean that you always get your own way. You should be rigid and inflexible, which is how uncompromising is usually used. But instead, I think of compromise as a phenomenon where you withhold parts of who you are, your desires, maybe challenges, whatever is alive inside you, you withhold that so you don't make your partner uncomfortable. Like if you say, oh, that I don't actually enjoy when you touch me that way, then it's not just that you're sharing yourself, it's that your partner will be offended, angry, shut down, whatever it is. And so we, t we get into the habit of not sharing we share some of us, of course, and we can be extreme. We can even be talking all the time, but not sharing the kinds of things that I bet people shared with you in the salon. Like as a physician, <laughs> I was trained to know, like when uh, this is like not to our subject, but just that's okay. Take a little detour <laughs> that when um, AIDS was first diagnosed and HIV education was so important. And so public health officials were trying to figure out how to educate the population. And they tried a lot of different things, which really didn't work. But in the end, it was training hairstylists on how to give information about preventing HIV and the importance of condom use and all that sort of thing, that that's when they started to change the incidence in a lot of different communities. And wow. so I have so much respect for the kind of safe space that stylists can create. I think there's something where, you know, you're not making eye contact, but it's still very intimate and you're it's close super to intimate. Another. Yes. I think it's the touching, the vulnerability and them just entrusting you. That's right. And, and yet it's not like eye to eye, face to face either, which provides another layer of safety. So anyway, I'm sure that you've heard lots of different things while cutting hair, styling hair, and that person's spouse has never heard that. Because again, back to compromise, we withhold things so as not to make our partner uncomfortable or deal with their response. So when I talk about uncompromising intimacy, I'm talking about getting to know yourself well enough to know what your desires are, what is true for you, and learning to say it in a way that your partner can understand. Do you think too that it's a that it's a fear of rejection as well, like that you're you're being vulnerable and you're putting yourself out there and potentially you could hurt their feelings? Or they could in turn hurt your feelings if you say something to them and then they say something back that you weren't ready to hear, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I think initially, like, <clears throat> you know, different personalities have different ways that this evolves. But I think in general, a woman is less, like, courageous to speak up because she feels ashamed, she doesn't want to be rejected like it's it's complicated but once she has enough kind of valuing enough value of herself or is comfortable enough to realize that what she's experiencing is important and that it won't just go away or fix itself if she pushes it aside so once she values what's in it for her, then the next phase can just be not wanting to have to deal with the partner's response. It's like, 
you know, if they're, if the partner's going to be angry, if the partner's going to just shut down and collapse, if they're, you know, going to hear something that, that they didn't know. And like, it's, it's very complicated. This is if we're talking about intimate matters, but also other things, because th this is true of men and women, both in and out of heteronormative relationships, but in different ways. But if I just focus on the woman's experience, it is astonishing how, how we get used to compromising, you know, like maybe your husband and children like pizza. And so even though you just love eating Thai food, Korean food, like something with a lot of different kinds of flavors, it's been years since the family did anything like that because it's just simpler. You just go for pizza, you'll find something there that'll work for you. Like when we, when I'm talking about compromise, we compromise in very small ways, like, I don't know where the utensils are kept in the kitchen if we have a spouse who cares about that. And also in bigger ways, like where we live, where we go on vacation, what color the living room is painted. Again, you know, not everybody cares about those things, but the the phenomenon, the sort of like insidious influence of compromise, it happens at a very small level, medium and big. So getting back to your question, invariably, when a couple is living like roommates, and they might still be intimate from time to time, but the vibe is much more of a close friends or kind of companionship as opposed to juicy husband and wife. Right. Invariably, both of them are withholding and not sometimes they know it sometimes they don't but it's like the culture of the marriage was created with only a relatively narrow range of things being permitted in their communication and so it like rocks the boat too much if they go outside of that and the thing is that we continue to grow and evolve and what was true when we got together some of that's still true but some of it's not from mm -hmm. like just all kinds of things and so what really is the best preventative med medicine for not ending up like roommates is to continue to share and bring more of ourselves into the relationship as we grow and evolve but once it's already happened then the way out of that literally is to speak more truth of your experience. It can start with, I feel like we've become roommates and I'd like to reignite the spark. Is that something that you're interested in too? Now I can say this super casually to you, but if somebody actually has a roommate relationship that's been going on for months, years, sometimes decades, that takes a lot of courage to say oh, what yeah. I just that's casually threw out. Scary, yeah, for sure. Because you don't know what your partner is thinking. And do you think that more times than not, the partner also feels the same? They're just not saying it? Or do you think that they're oblivious and they're just like, wait, what? I thought we were fine. You know, there's definitely plenty of times where it's, I thought we were fine. And what I think is also extremely common is that the other person has just compartmentalized it, taken their attention off. And so even though it's true, it's just not something they're focused on. And I think it's less common but it does also happen that both people are feeling the burden and it's just a matter of who's going to say something first, because we, we all cope in different ways with stress, with disconnection, with unmet yearning. And some of us start thinking about it and it's like, 
you can't look at your spouse without thinking about the fact that you can't remember when you last had a passionate kiss and the other person is just like thinking about what what show you're going to watch later like we we do different things with our attention some consciously and some not but i want to make sure to say very very clearly that in my opinion my conviction is that having a fantastic relationship is a learnable skill so no matter what your circumstances whether you're like new in a relationship maybe not yet engaged or recently engaged and you just never had role models that inspired you and so you can wonder like are, are we going to be able to do it differently? Yes, you can learn how. If you've been together for 35 years and you have your routines and the things that are familiar and you're just like used to doing things, you can learn how and everything in between. I was, I wrote down um, where you had said, you're not the problem and your spouse is not the problem. Because if you do run into a problem, it's easy just to say, well, if he would just do this or that, or, you know, and he's probably thinking, well, if maybe she would make the first move, then things would, you know, I, but it, that's not the case. I liked that you said that because it's easy to blame. So what is the problem? If it's not them and it's not you, what's the problem? Well, <laughs> it's hard to say in general terms, because it be depends what the situation is, but what I would say is the problem is the lack of connection, the lack of feeling on the same team. So one of the things that I often coach my clients on is to focus on connection over content. Okay. So even if there's some very specific piece of content, like um, I'm coaching a couple right now and it's very complicated for them to choose where they're gonna go on vacation having to do with what her family wants and what his family wants and the weather and, uh, you know, just lots of, it's very, very complicated. And so if, as they navigate this, they focus on each maintaining their position, each made, making sure, look, I need to go while the snow is, to, you know, mm -hmm. this is, this is the last opportunity this year to have this experience, you know, just really, or, focusing on the feeling of connection between them while having the conversation. And that very small pivot, focusing on the connection, never losing sight of it, never having it take a back seat to the specific content you're sharing, that, that um, brings results that just are totally unavailable if you're thinking, if he would just change or if she would just change. So what does that mean exactly? Focusing on the connection. Like, what does that look like in a make pretend circumstance? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it is easier when we have a specific example. So let me just think of one super quickly. Like, um, let's just say whether to send the kids to private school or public school. And I'm picking that example because they can't go to both. They're not mm -hmm. going to go to both. It's going to be one or the other. And this is something that I don't know how often it comes up, but it comes up in families where one parent, it's just for whatever reasons, it's so important that the children go to public school and the other parent, it's so important that the kids go to private mm -hmm. school. So in that scenario, if while having the conversation, your top priority is to convince your spouse of your position. Look, it's so important that they go to public school, then they'll be able to interact with lots of different people. They'll be able to play with kids in the neighborhood. Da, 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 da. There are tons of reasons why someone would want their kids to go to public school for sure. But if the focus is all on like essentially setting it up as a debate, where you're trying to use logic to convince your partner, that rarely works. Mm -hmm. But if instead your focus is on the feeling of the conversation, so that yes, you're talking about 
where the kids go to school, but you could be talking about any number of other things as well because your primary focus is on feeling connected. And that usually means speaking a little bit more slowly the way I am now with a gentler tone. And instead of coming with like all of the reasons, don't you see da, 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 da. demands? No. Yeah. And like, just the main thing you're waiting for to conclude the conversation is that your spouse changes their mind as opposed to saying like making one point and then saying, you know, well, is that important to you too? And checking and just basically staying connected, feeling like the two of you are having a conversation about something that matters to both of you and that how you have that conversation is almost more important or is more important than what the outcome is. And you are far more likely to come to an outcome that works for everybody when the focus is on connection. And if the focus is just on debate and convincing your partner to change their mind, that's actually a very inefficient and less likely to succeed method of doing so anyway. So it's like a win-win. You're, you're likely to come up with an outcome that you both feel good about and the process of getting there will be more connected. And then when you end up saying things, there can be just more revealing because it's more safe to share what's really underneath. Mm -hmm. So if you tell your significant other, I just feel like we just live like roommates. There's just not a lot of connection anymore. I'm just not feeling that. And they agree. So you're starting on the same platform. Where do you take it from there? What do you do? It's kind of hard to just like, okay, let's get spicy. <laughs> like, if you feel like you've really kind of gone separate and just been doing your own thing, how do you come back together and bring that intimacy and bring that closeness? Because it's really hard when you are a parent and you've got the kids and all that stuff and you both might really want to have that connection, but how do you feasibly get there? Okay, well- you don't start with a focus on what's happening in the bedroom. You start with a focus on opening communication and having more fun. And I will just say that if you're listening and you're serious about this, then you should definitely check out my course called The Aligned and Hot Marriage, which is, it just provides all of the tools through communication, going through different scenarios and prompts and principles. So it like, I have lots of people who've gone through that program and then this issue is no longer their okay. issue. Okay, yeah. But, but I will say more so that just listening that you want to have fun together. And one of the ways to have fun is to have a little more variety. So in the roommate scenario, it's like emotionally the world has narrowed and also in terms of the activity. So you're more likely to go to the movies in the same theaters. If you go out for that, go to the same restaurants, have the same conversation topics. Like there's a sameness about it and you don't need to like stretch into risque things like start by going to I don't know, a strip club is what I was thinking. I don't know where that comes from. I don't think, that, but the point is like, it's not about spiciness. It's about fun and vitality and being interested in one another. So really you could just start by thinking about what are the things that are fun and maybe you enjoy going to aquariums, but you haven't been in like 10 years. Well, Go to an aquarium and see if it still is fun. And you may want to go back again, or you may not. But either way, the exploration can be very gratifying. Sure. And so just starting by thinking about what are the things that are fun to do together and have more of them. Date. That's just a, yeah, 
it can be a date, you know, date often has like romance. And if you're not used to dating, maybe you're into it, but that can feel like pressure. And so I'm, I'm actually not talking, I'm talking about like taking a walk in a park, going for a bike ride, going for a car ride, like just things that you could do on a date, but I'm not emphasizing the date part. I'm emphasizing the have fun part. Mm -hmm. I think too, um, a, what I would consider kind of a battle that's probably fairly new in the last 15 years is just devices and our significant others being in their phones, whether they're answering emails from work or talking to their friends, you know, fantasy football league, whatever. And no matter who is doing that, the other person kind of feels slighted. Like, why don't we have that connection anymore? Why can't we just sit and talk? Why is it always with the phone or always with the, you know, checking your email and stuff like that? How do you, how do you conquer that battle? Well, I do think phones are great for keeping the energy flowing back and forth when you're not together. Like, there are plenty of days my husband and I don't text one another, but there are also plenty of days when we do. And it's sometimes it's practical stuff. Sometimes it's super flirty. Like it is a communication line, which I think can really be used for good, especially when you're apart from one another, mm -hmm. assuming that, you know, you can text where you are. But I think it's incredibly important to have some amount of time. I mean, it depends what phase of life you're in and, like if, if you've got a bunch of kids and you're exhausted by the time they go, you know, then this isn't realistic. But as soon as you're able to have like half an hour where you just don't have the phones with you and there's clear data that the quality of the conversation is diminished when you have the phone, even if it's turned down on the yeah. table but mm -hmm. if it's in view it's like there's an additional person there with right. all of the dopamine possibilities you yes. know so to like literally have it out of sight for both of you and the sound turned off so that it's not visually or auditorially you know it's your eyes and your ears are not perceiving the phone and yes have you don't have to have philosophical conversations unless you enjoy that but just have the kind of conversation that is more carefree and where it doesn't feel like there's a third wheel present yeah i think it's more just like a sign of respect that you are 100 percent there that there's no distraction there you know i am tuned into you i am going to listen you're being heard you're being validated because I feel like it is, it's rude and it's rude to do that to anybody. But if you're trying to have a really um, intimate connection with your partner, I feel like the phone needs to be put away. It needs to be left somewhere else. Yes. And I also think it's nice to have the phones put away when you're not like totally focused on one another. Like maybe you take a stroll or you sit on a park bench and you're both watching the sunset or watching kids play on the playground, you don't have to be actively engaging with one another. Intimacy can grow in the pauses in between. And, you know, it, it, yes, you want to really be listening when your spouse is speaking and vice versa, but you also can just, you know, being quiet and let your minds wander in a way that the connection feels so different if you're on your phones, but I want to add one more thing, which is I think the main thing is actually to communicate about it because there can be times where like you both have work to do. And so you're sitting there and actually it's stressful not to do it. And so you just agree, you know what, tonight let's be on our phones. The real problem is when one person wants your full attention without the phone in your hand and the mm -hmm. other person is like, well, I'm listening, you know, while they're, and so to just be able, this would be a place where if, if your partner has their phone out while speaking, you could be nice, compromise, not say anything. 
you could be nasty and critical and tell them how disrespectful and what is wrong with them. This is our time to talk. Or in what I would call an uncompromising way, you could say with vulnerability that I miss you and I really look forward to our conversations and I feel less important when you're on your phone. There's no blame in that, but that means that your partner has a better chance of more easily and gladly putting the phone down and joining you. Mm -hmm. So you are an intimacy coach. What exactly, who comes to see an intimacy coach? Are they people that are just like fighting or, <laughs> or are they just needing a little bit of help? I mean, what, what kind of people come to you and what do you do for them? Yeah. So I am a relationship and intimacy coach. And, and so it's really both words. There are people who are strictly sex and intimacy coaches, but that's not me. I have all of those skills, but I'm a relationship and intimacy coach. So the people that, um, that I see, well, for the most part, they are high performing, educated professionals, people who are competent, used to knowing how to get ahead in their career, in their personal life, health, fitness, and all those things. And they're not really sure how to up level and improve the relationship. And that could be because one of them just found out the other one has been having an affair. It can be because they just can't get on the same page, but far more often the couples that I'm coaching, basically things look really good from the outside. They, they look stable, they look like a happy family, social media and in person, it looks like things are really good. But on the inside, it doesn't actually feel that way. And often in that scenario, like patterns have formed in how they interact with one another and the assumptions they're making and the expectations they have. And they don't really know how to get unstuck. And it happens very quickly with some good education because for the most part, people don't have education about how to be in relationship. And so when they, when I give some education, my clients get results really quite quickly because it's just new information. So, um, Sometimes people come because they're arguing that's infrequent far more often. It's the roommate scenario that you've talked about, you know, either they're not having much sex or they haven't had sex in a while and they don't really know exactly how to reignite the spark. And then I also have clients who come where it really is more preventative. It's like they've seen what happens to other people. Mm -hmm. How do they set themselves up so that doesn't happen to them? Do you only see couples or do you have single women that come to you that maybe are having a hard time finding um, uh, somebody to date? Because I feel like I, I went through a divorce and in between my first husband and my second husband, I got a little jaded, a little, you know, I was just like independent woman and I'm going to work and I'm going to do this. I'm going to feed my kids and do it all on my own. And I remember when I first started dating my husband my current husband, he made a comment one time where I said, I can do it. And he said, Oh, I know you can, you make that very clear all the time. And I thought, <laughs> Oh, I am shooting myself in the foot by He's acting like, like, I don't need a man though. You know, like I was putting off that aura of, I don't need no man. <laughs> I can do this on my own. So are there women or men that come to you that need coaching as far as dating too? Yeah, so the bulk of my clients are couples and I really love working with couples together because the transformation is more rapid when they witness one another's growth mm -hmm. and evolution. And then the second most common for me is to work individually with people who are in relationships. Yeah. And I do also, but I'm very particular about who I work with 
who isn't partnered. And mostly um, the reason for that is that what I, the work that I do with couples is unique. There's, there's basically nobody working with couples the way that I do. There are people who do things that are similar, but even then it's not very many. And when it comes to dating, I think there are many good dating coaches out there. And so, um, and I don't think it's that hard actually to find them that, that, that learning mm -hmm. is really beautiful and available. Yeah. And the work that I do with couples who've been together for 15 years, 35 years, there just are not a lot of coaches who know how to guide them into really like the next awakening within their relationship. Right. So is that, okay, your book, Un Uncompromising Intimacy, um, tell me about it. Tell them about it. What What's your book about? Okay, well, the first chapter really just sets the landscape for the different kinds of relationships that there are. And there are four relationship types that I identify. Okay. One, the intimate marriage, conscious partnership is the kind of thing that most people really want. But what most people have is a toleration relationship, a relationship that is greatly seasoned with compromise. Mm -hmm. And then there are other kinds as well. And so after describing the different kinds of relationships and the rest of the book is stories and instruction on how to transition from the toleration relationship to conscious partnership, to an intimate marriage, how to, I don't use this language in the book, but it's the same idea that we're talking about, like how to transition from being roommates to having a passionate, really gratifying, fulfilling relationship and the way to do that is exactly what I spell out in the pages of my book. It's actually pretty easy to follow. I have many people whom I've never met who read the book and completely transform their relationship without a lot of effort because I'm just sharing kind of basic skills that people haven't thought about before, but it's not because they're so complicated. It's because it just hasn't come across, you know, their horizon. Right. I had, I just thought of this, um, uh, one of my hair clients, I had done their family's hair for years and years, and this was the husband of the family. And again, I knew them all. And I remember it was their wedding anniversary. And I said, Oh my gosh, Tim, I can't believe you've been married to the same woman for 30 years. And he said, Oh, she's not the same woman. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought yes. that was so funny because it's true. We all change. We evolve, you know, from the moment you get married and say, I do to 10, 15, however many years later, you're not the same person. So your likes, your dislikes, all of that, you kind of have to get to know yourself and get to know your spouse again. It's like a clean slate, really. It's kind of exciting. Yes. Well, it's certainly healthy to look at it as exciting. And you're reminding me of a quote that um, everyone is um, goes through many marriages. It's just some people are lucky enough to have it be with the same person. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. It's, and you said, how long have you been married to your husband? 28 years. Oh, congratulations. That's amazing. Thank you. It's Thank a huge you. feat. I mean, cause it does, it takes a lot of effort. It's not for the, the week. <laughs> yes. I was and, weak. <laughs> well, you know, I don't look at it that way. I really don't, but, um, you know, sometimes divorce is the right thing, but for my clients, as long as they both want to stay together, I can help them go very far with that. Yeah, that's it's awesome. It's when one person has given up and I don't judge them for doing so, but when one person is giving up, then it changes things so much that, that, um, yeah, sometimes that, that change of heart just needs to be respected. Right. So tell people how they can find you and your book and your podcast and all that stuff. 
Okay, so my website is alexandrastockwell.com. And if you go there, you can download the first chapter of my book for free. You can find links to the Intimate Marriage Podcast. I'm active on social media. And um, if you're interested in the Aligned and Hot Marriage Program or private coaching, all of that you can find at alexandrastockwell.com. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really I enjoyed this. It's so interesting. And it's always good for people to hear that they're not the only ones too. I think, you know, you don't wish that upon other people, but just knowing, okay, maybe we're not the only ones that are struggling with this. That kind of makes you feel a little bit better about it. So true. And these are really, really common phenomena. So yeah. thank you for choosing to focus on the topic. Of course. Well, it was nice to meet you. You take care and I will be in touch. Sounds good. Thank All you right. Bye-bye. Bye.